Well, the first thing is I'm not used to speaking to this many people. <laughs> Thursday morning is, I went to the Thursday morning men's for many years and um, a 10 was a big crowd. <laughs> so this is kind of nice, but what's interesting, my wife and I started attending this church when it was just two months old. This church started in February of 2002. We came for the first service in April of 2002, and there were about this many people in the gym at Pine Island Elementary. And I told my wife, man, it's going to be great to go to a small church again, because <laughs> we left a big one. <laughs> we left a big one. You know, it's been interesting trying, well, let me back up with one other point about my style of speaking. It's, um, uh, I was a Grand Rapids police officer for 34 years, so you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> so uh, if you've ever read a police report, they're not entertaining. They cover who, what, why, when, where, how, and how much in as few as words as possible. You don't get a lot of, it was a dark and stormy night in a police report, and so, uh, yeah, it might be just straight to the point and blunt. And what's interesting, I knew, well, well, first of all, Boone, what about a shipwreck reminded you of me? <laughs> That's the title of tonight, or coming out of failure. Um, and that's, that's funny. I got to say one thing about Boone. Yeah, I've told him this story, so. Uh, got to back up a little bit farther. Uh, I'll get to this part, but I, I was hired as a pastor by Pastor Doug in 2004. I'll get back to that, but it, I got to know his brother Jonathan, and one time I went out to the house, Jonathan's house when he lived out on Grand River, and Boone had just got back from hunting. And uh, he was, you know, in his camel and face paint, and he was eating. And uh, Jonathan said, well, I want to introduce you to my brother Boone. He said, that's him over there. Boone's eating. Looks up and goes back to eating. <laughs> it's just great. It's just great to see the man of God he has transformed into. And it's just a pleasure to serve with you, man. Thank you. So I had a, I had a great message all written out. And I went to the second draft and the third draft, and I erased most of the third draft. <laughs> so I was going to tell you stories, you know, about how uh, my wild goose chases, how a police officer ended up <laughs> going to jails and prisons in 19 years speaking to inmates. That was definitely a goose chase. And there are other things. Uh, let me just say that all my... All the goose chases that I've gone on have started out small, and they haven't been very appealing. Uh, and that will probably be the same with you. But if you'll answer the call, if you'll say yes and step up, well, boy, God's got a lot in store. So we came, like I said, in April of 2002, the uh, then original men's pastor took an interest in me. What I didn't realize at the time, he was grooming me to be his uh, replacement because <laughs> he wanted to go back and be a senior pastor. And, um, you know, I just worked around the church, volunteered, attended men's meetings. And then... Uh, in 2004, my son at age 27 decided he didn't want to go to Bible school. He's what you would call a late bloomer. His mother and I just wanted to see a, a blossom every once in a while to know that there was life in the root system. But we're so thankful that 27, he decided to go to Christ for the Nations, and now he's a pastor in Mississippi. But he was not a good student in high school, and I didn't want him to, to work very much to, so he could apply himself to his studies. So when it came time uh, to be interviewed by Pastor Doug, I said, well, I, I, I do need a salary to cover my son's 
uh, school expenses. And Pastor Doug graciously hired me. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the heart of the message. What I'm gonna talk to you tonight about is offense, being offended, holding on to unforgiveness, what it does to you. Uh, to summarize ch chapter six in one sentence, like what uh, uh, Pastor Mark said, you can't control what happened to you, but you can control your attitude. You still have the choice. And when I got hired, uh, even though I had, I had done pastoral type things, I had no experience doing this. And over time, when you start working closely with people, you see their flaws. When you see them operate in their giftings, you think, wow, what a giant they are of the faith. But we all have flaws. And as I began to see Pastor Duggs and the, uh, then who was the associate pastor, um, Steve Croft, what was once so glorious now started to uh, get a little tarnished. And by 2010, I said, I've had enough. I'm out of here at the end of the year. I submitted my resignation letter. And I told my wife, we're leaving. And I even, I, I, could, I could tell you the church I had picked out that I was going to go to. The reason why we're still here, if any of you have met my wife, she's about this tall. But she's tougher than nails. <laughs> And she looked at me and said, hey, you want to leave? Go ahead. I like it here. I'm staying. Now I'm offended with my wife. <laughs> and Pastor Doug is such a grace giver. Even though he knew I was offended and you know, I wasn't going to leave without my wife, um, he still gave me a platform asked me to lead a, a prayer group in the first service, which I still do. He knew I was offended. He's a sharp guy. But he extended grace to me. And it wasn't until, so I resigned at the end of 2010, so you've got 2011 and 2012 were lean years. I was here. I was doing some good things, but uh, boy, not what it could have been. But it, so it wasn't until February of 2013 that I read the book, The Bait of Satan, by John Bevere. And it filleted me like you would cut open a fish. Or like you'd gut a deer. I mean, it just tore me up. And I began to get revelation. Ah, this is hard to talk about. I began to get revelation of all the offenses I've been hanging on to since childhood, especially with my mother. Now, let, let me give you a guideline here. This is not a hard, fast rule, but it's generally true. If you're holding unforgiveness against your mother, you will have intimacy issues with your wife. And if you're holding unforgiveness against your dad, you'll probably have a hard time submitting to authority. And I had intimacy issues with my wife. But these last nine years, these have been the best years of my life. I love what Mark Batterson says, it's never too late to become the man you could have been. I'm 74 years old, almost 75. And these last nine years have been the most fruitful, peaceful, blessed. Oh, there's been problems, don't get me wrong. And there's been numerous opportunities to get offended. But you just know that's Satan's siren, siren call, and he just wants to pull you into a trap. But I want to speak this last example as a warning to everybody here about offense. Both my parents died 
by the time I was 29 and before I had children. Uh, my firstborn, Ted, is named after my dad. And when Ted was six, he wanted to see his grandma and grandpa's graveside. And I said, yeah, okay, so one, one Sunday on the way home from church, we stopped. I remembered the general area of where my parents' grave was, but I wasn't sure. And so I'm kind of wandering all over the place, and my son and my wife and daughter's off in the distance. And about the time I f found their grave marker, my son was walking towards me and was getting near. When I saw my parents' names, there was an emotion that hit me right in the gut. And had I been alone, I would have fallen to my knees sobbing. But my son was walking towards me. And I stuffed it. And I didn't deal with it for another 30 years. Please don't make that mistake. Were those wasted years? Not completely. But they weren't maximized because I was hindered from walking in the full will of God because of the cancer of unforgiveness. And it is a cancer. I don't use that word cancer lightly. And if you don't believe it's a cancer, listen to this verse. Hebrews 12, 15. Watch out. Now he's writing this to believers. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. It's serious business to hold on to unforgiveness. That's the heart of God, is to forgive. And when we don't forgive, it doesn't harm the other person. Well, I take that back. It did harm my wife. Just a few months ago, she... I knew I harmed her. But there was a part of me that didn't care. That shows how, how hot and cold I could run. But a few months ago, she told me that, that there was a point in our marriage, and uh, we celebrate 49 years next month, there was a point in our marriage that she strongly considered divorcing me. I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my wife forgiving me and the grace of God. Mark Batterson says on page 106, this is in chapter 5, he said, I love this, offense is where many wild goose chases get stalled. When you're fulfilling God's purpose, Satan's plan is to get you out of it. He only has one weapon. That's deception. And if he can get you offended, he'll get you deceived. Just stop and think. If Satan could convince Adam and Eve to think God wasn't treating them unfairly in, an, in a sinless environment. If when Satan was Lucifer, the worship leader in heaven, and he could convince a third of the angels to re rebel against God, he's really good at what he does. He only has one weapon, but he's really, really good at it. And I'm not here to glorify Satan, but I am to warn you, he's good at deceiving us. It starts with a little lie. It starts, all he's looking for is a crack so that he can get a toehold. And over time, that toehold will become a foothold. Then it will become a stronghold. And then it will become a stranglehold. I know this is, this, is, this is not a fun message, but it's a real message. It's truth. I've lived it. I don't want you to live it. 
and I know not everyone in this room is, is holy not and unforgiveness. I have a couple men in our group, they, they don't have an issue with that, and that's wonderful. But I've led probably uh, at least six classes uh, on the curriculum of the Bay of Satan over the years since then, and I've never found less than half the people in the room once they start to think about it and allow the Holy Spirit to speak, they're offended. Could be with mom, with dad, a sibling, a spouse, an ex-spouse. It's common. I don't want you to go through that. So, not tonight, not in group. I don't want this to be a part of the group discussion, even though that's what I've talked about a lot. Hopefully we'll get more into the book. But when you're alone, ask the Holy Spirit if you're holding on to unforgiveness against anyone. How will you know? Generally speaking, if a name, if you're praying this prayer in sincerity, and there's a name that flashes across your mind, and your first reaction on, on, hear, on seeing that name or hearing that name is a, eh, that's a clue. <laughs> if, you got a great, if you have a nice, peaceful, velvety feeling, you're good. But again, I don't want to see anybody repeat the mistakes. Life, man, life is good now. Life is good. I do not want to die. I know where I'm going. If I died tonight, I know I'm going to heaven. There's no doubt. But I've only been really alive for nine years. And I want 15 more. I want 15 more. So let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you for your grace. Ah, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I pray for my brothers tonight that, that if any is, anyone is holding on unforgiveness against anybody, that you'd make it clear. You don't condemn, and you're not gonna con you didn't condemn them. You, me, you won't condemn them, but you will make them aware if there's anybody. I hope there's nobody. I hope everybody is more mature than I was. But I know how crafty the enemy can be. So, Father, bless our fellowship. Bless our discussions tonight. But be with us. By your grace, lead us into all truth. And show us if we're holding anything against anybody so that we can forgive and walk in the fullness of your grace and enjoy the wild goose chases. Thank you.